Hello everyone, my name is Preston Dennett and welcome to another episode of UFOs and the Paranormal. This episode is called Malmstrom, A New Witness Speaks. On March 16, 1967, an incredible event occurred at Malmstrom Air Force Base in Montana. Multiple UFOs hovered at very low elevation over the base and were seen by many of the military officers there. One by one, the nuclear Minuteman ICBM missiles were shut down. This, of course, caused near panic at the base, especially at the very high levels, and there was an immediate investigation and a cover-up of the events, a cover-up which is still in place to this day. One of the main witnesses was Captain Robert Salas. He was present when this event occurred. And as Robert Salas says, the events involved the sudden shutdown of nearly 20 nuclear missiles while UFOs were in close proximity to these weapons. Following this event, uh, Captain Salas was told not to discuss it. Uh, but he couldn't get what happened out of his mind, and he eventually uh, started to investigate it. He located other witnesses, and in 1994, Captain Robert Salas bravely went public with what happened at Malmstrom Air Force Base. Eleven years later, in 2005, he released his excellent book, Faded Giant, which presented the events of what happened at Malmstrom Air Force Base. In 2015, a gentleman, a 77-year-old retired military officer, was contacted by his daughter, who had just seen a television program on the Discovery Channel featuring UFOs and presenting this incredible event, which occurred at Malmstrom Air Force Base, on March 16, 1967. His daughter was excited because she remembered that her father had told her about being there at the base when this event occurred. Mel Hansen himself was delighted to hear that this event was being spoken about publicly and he decided it was time for him to go public and share his story of his participation in this incredible event. And this video is the story of Mel Hansen's participation in this event. It's a story that has not been publicly released before, and he tells it here for the first time. Mel was born in 1938. After graduating from college, he spent six years in the U.S. Army and was given an honorable discharge in 1962. He then worked in a civilian capacity for the U.S. Air Force, performing aircraft repair, modification and flight test, missile repair and testing, and quality assurance and systems program management. It was a job he would hold for 37 years, eventually becoming a division chief before he retired from that position, and then worked at Tool Army Depot for two years, and later at Raytheon Corporation as a missile engineer at Misau Army Base in Germany. He is also a licensed contractor and master carpenter. On the evening of March 16, 1967, Mel Hansen, who was then 29 years old, was a member of a depot maintenance team performing modifications of the Minuteman ICBM launch facility on the outskirts of Malmstrom Air Force Base. There were 10 launch facilities assigned and identified as Alpha Flight, primarily A3 and A5. As Mel says, I was a missile quality assurance manager on a modification and maintenance team from Hill Air Force Base in Utah. The work we performed at the time was on the actual missile launch facilities of Alpha and Bravo flight. The launch facilities are not manned. The launch and monitoring of the sites are performed by the launch control facility, each which controls 10 missiles. 
The launch control facility is manned by two armed USAF missile launch control officers. If and when the launch commands are given, it takes both crew members to simultaneously turn the launch key within one second. It is physically impossible for one person to enter the launch boat command. The launch control facility is on a manned complex and has the underground launch control facility, a manned security desk, and houses the combat security teams that patrol the launch control facility access roads and man maintains site security. They are heavily armed and can respond with deadly force. At times, missile maintenance crew members also stay at the launch control facility. The strike teams are on the road 24 hours a day and respond directly from the desk sergeant who, under unusual circumstances, responds from orders directly from the launch crew. The launch crew and security personnel are given extensive training on how to cope and deal with stressful situations. On this particular evening, Mel was working the graveyard shift monitoring the maintenance crew team. And along with them was a armed USAF security officer. And as Mel says, and I quote, Sometime after midnight, the guard was sitting in my government car on the site, taking a break and having a cup of coffee. Not much was happening on his tactical radio or on my site activation task force radio. It was a clear, dark night, and the guard and I stepped out of the car so he could have a smoke. It was a beautiful, star-filled sky. However, it seemed really eerie. You could feel it in the air. It was unusually quiet. The rest of the crew, three maintenance guys, were working on the silo. Suddenly, the guard's radio started to say that some unknown airborne activity was occurring near our site, A3 and A5. And as we stood by the car, something really strange was happening in the sky. A little to the west of us, about where the commercial electric power poles for the site were located, but almost directly above the launcher, it was virtually silent. But you could sense its presence and see something blocking the stars directly above the silo. There was no doubt something really strange was happening, and yes, both myself and the guard were concerned and scared. Looking up, Mel could see a very large, dark object blocking out the stars. It was immediately apparent to him this was not a balloon, not a normal aircraft. It was very clearly a UFO. As Mel says, I have been on almost all of the Minuteman missile sites and all 54 Titan missile sites, and I have never experienced anything like what was happening. The guard's radio really came alive with obvious confusion on what to do next. The guard became excited and somewhat confused, waiting for further instruction. Things were happening so fast, I have no recollection of how, all of this, how long all of this lasted. At the time of this incident, Captain Robert Salas was on duty. He was on alert duty as the Deputy Missile Combat Crew Commander at the Oscar Flight Launch Control Facility. His phone rang, and the flight security controller explained that he and another airman were observing, quote, some strange lights over the site. Captain Salas asked him, what kind of lights? The officer replied, well, they're just lights flying around and making some strange maneuvers. Captain Salas said, you mean they're UFOs? The officer said, well, something like that. All we can tell you is they're not aircraft. Salas wondered if the officer was joking, uh, although he clearly wasn't, and he advised the officer to keep observing the lights and inform him if they should approach any closer, and he hung up. A short time later, his phone rang again, and it was the same guard who said, Sir, 
there's one hovering over the front gate. Captain Robert Salas said, one what? And the officer replied, a UFO. It's just sitting there. We're all looking at it. What do you want us to do? Captain Salas had the officer describe what he was seeing, and the officer had difficulty explaining it and could only tell him that it was, quote, a glowing red object. Captain Salas ordered the guard to secure the site while he immediately phoned the command post. Salas told his commander, Lieutenant Fred Mywald, and explained what the guards were seeing. And in the middle of this conversation, an alarm went off and a quote, no-go light and other red security lights indicated a problem at one of the missile sites. As Captain Salas says, another alarm went off at another site, then two more simultaneously. Within the next few seconds, we had lost eight to ten missiles in a no-go condition. On this night, First Lieutenant Walt Feigl was on duty as the deputy crew commander below ground at the Echo Flight Launch Control Center. This is, of course, separate from the Oscar flight. And when the alarm went off and one of the missiles indicated a no-go status, he called the missile site thinking angrily that they had failed to inform him and that they had started their maintenance job without letting him know. Instead, the guard informed him that a UFO was hovering over the site. Lieutenant Feigl assumed that the man was drinking when without any notice, all 10 missiles began to shut off in rapid succession. With Lieutenant Feigl at the time was Captain Eric Carlson, who also verified this incident and both men were reportedly very shaken by what was occurring. Meanwhile, back at the A-3 missile site, Mel Hansen and his team continued to observe this huge dark object hovering directly above the silo when, without warning, all power at the site failed. As Mel says in his own words, suddenly the commercial power to the site shut down and the diesel generator came on and the site went on emergency power. The maintenance guys came topside to see what was going on. Then the diesel shut down and the silo went on battery power. At the time, the lunch officer ordered everyone, the guard, three other guys, and me, to stay in their cars and monitor the tactical radios. At this time, the same thing was occurring at A5, which was not occupied at the time, and you could hear the roving patrolman's radio traffic saying that they had seen UFOs hovering above A3 and A5, and they appeared to be observing both sites. The situation, along with the radio traffic, seemed totally unreal, and there was a lot of confusion on how to respond. The guard with me just sat in the car staring at his radio, confused and not knowing what to do. We were again told to stay in our cars until further notice. Uh, Mel obeyed and stayed in his car for some time, but at some point curiosity got the best of him and he decided to venture outside so he could get a closer look. As Mel says, and again I quote, I got out and stood by the car door and I could tell that something really strange was happening. Then the battery power to the silo shut down and it was really quiet other than the confusion on the radios. I can't say for sure how long, but it seems like this incident lasted about 10 or 15 minutes because that's about the time it would take for the strike team to get to the site. When they finally got there, we had been given orders to return to the base, which is about an hour's drive. And as they arrived at the site, the commercial power came back on and the site seemed to return to normal. We were told to leave and return to the base. The site was secured and we left. We, the guard and I, knew that within an hour, both sites would be swarming with investigators and security people and we were right. The guard was not very talkative on the drive back and was only concerned about how he reacted to the situation. 
and when we arrived back at the base, we were met by some Air Force officers who took the guard and told me to where to report for a debriefing. The rest of the team was there when I got there, and these very serious Air Force officers and two persons in civilian clothes told us in no uncertain terms that we were not to discuss this incident in any shape or form, and that we would be given additional information as it occurred. I didn't count on this happening. Mel, of course, was right. He was never informed after that what the investigation into this in incident revealed. Uh, nor was he questioned again. He was, however, given another stern warning to remain silent and not talk about what happened. As he says, the next morning, the team and I were given another don't say a word or you will lose your job briefing. We were then given an armed escort out to the site to retrieve our equipment and tools and move out onto another site outside of the 10 A-flight launch sites. I never did understand why they let us get the tools and equipment that soon after the incident. When we arrived at A3 to get our stuff, the site looked like an anthill. Mel and his team quickly gathered their tools, their equipment, and left the site. As Mel says, we never saw the guard again. Our TDY, temporary duty, assignment was cut short a couple weeks later and we returned to Hale Air Force Base. No one wanted to lose their job, so nothing to my knowledge was discussed about this incident. Mel dutifully remained completely silent. He told no one and did not talk about it. He only made one exception to this. Uh, one of his good friends, Dale Snyder, was also a team member and together he and Dale would occasionally talk about what happened on that amazing night. As Mel says, we didn't want to lose our jobs, but we did on rare occasions talk about what happened that night. We both agreed on my version. His was almost identical. The only difference was he was down in the silo when it started, and I was topside sitting in the car. Every detail other than that was identical. Unfortunately, at this time, all the team members of Mel's team, including his friend Dale Snyder, have since passed away. And in uh, 2015, when Mel, who was then 77 years old, heard about this incident, uh, he realized how important it was and that it was time for him to share his version of the events. He, he wanted to make sure that his story wasn't lost to history and that people knew what happened at Malmstrom Air Force Base on March 16, 1967. As Mel says, I have been a believer in extraterrestrial occurrences from my teen years to the present, and when this incident occurred, it wasn't like the Hollywood version of hovering, humming, flying saucers with little guys with big eyes and long arms. It happened with silent precision in an almost unbelievable manner. I believe the Malmstrom Air Force Base missile wing was chosen because of the remoteness of some of the missile sites. Alpha Flight was actually in a mountainous region with big hills with lots of pine trees. It was an ideal scene for this incident. Robert Salas, of course, covered this event uh, in his book, Faded Giant. Mel Hansen's story is not told in Faded Giant. Uh, Robert Salas did not know about Mel Hansen's story. Uh, he does now. Uh, but Mel Han or, uh, Robert Salas, uh, like Mel Hansen, says that he was also given a debriefing of this event and a warning to remain silent. Uh, immediately following this event, Salas related the events to Colonel George Eldridge, and an officer from the Air Force Office of Special Investigations, the AFOSI. As Captain Robert Salas says, and I quote, 
Upon completing our briefing, we were told that the incident was to be considered highly classified. We were not to discuss it with anyone, including our spouses or fellow crew members. In the more than two years that I remained on assignment at Malmstrom Air Force Base, neither I nor other crew members were ever told about the progress or the results of the ensuing Air Force investigation. Captain Robert Salas and other researchers who looked into this incident later did find out what allegedly happened according to the Air Force investigation. According to the Air Force, the official explanation is that each of the missiles had gone offline due to a problem with the guidance and control systems. Most of the missiles remained inoperable for almost an entire day, and the Air Force investigators speculated that some sort of electromagnetic pulse, or EMP, may have caused the incident. Uh, that was their initial theory, but this was ruled out as they said there was no source for any kind of EMP. Of course, other than the UFO itself, which they did not mention in their investigation. And meanwhile, the Air Force apparently did its best to scrub out any mention of UFOs at all in the official records. And they were successful. However, UFO researchers have since located official documents about this incident on that night. Uh, there are declassified documents about how these missiles were shut, shut down. And investigators, of course, also have the testimonies of other witnesses who were there. One of the witnesses was state security police officer James J. Ortel, who was on duty that night. As Officer Ortel says, and I quote, I observed an unidentified flying object pass over the entrance gate and fly in close proximity past the window. At least two other air pol policemen acknowledged seeing the same thing. Airman Robert Morales was also on duty that night, and he observed this incident. He was on duty while these missiles were being brought back online almost 24 hours after the initial incident, and it was getting dark, and as he says, we were watching the lights in the sky. They would streak, and then they would stop in the sky, and they were going back and forth. They were getting really close to us and would go across the horizon. To this day, the Air Force still denies, officially at least, that any UFOs were seen on that evening. Mel Hansen has his own speculations about why the UFOs were there and what happened at Malmstrom. As he says, I believe the circumstances involved a UFO that either had a mechanical failure and needed to recharge its systems or was on a training mission for the same reason. I think their propulsion system requires large amounts of various types of electricity to recharge, and to do so they had to power down the launch site. They chose remote missile sites in Montana because they assumed they would not be occupied. But A-3 was occupied. The other site, A-5, was not occupied. Maybe they wanted to see if it made any difference if the site was occupied. Based on what happened, it apparently didn't make any difference. Whatever the reason for this incident, Mel Hansen says that he will never forget it. As he says, I know without any reservation what I witnessed in Montana actually happened. Although this incident happened many years ago, I remember it like it was yesterday. There is intelligent life in the vast openness of space. Maybe someday they will be so common that their presence cannot be denied. Following this, Mel also had another incredible UFO sighting. Mel's story about what happened to him at Malmstrom Air Force Base, again, is not told in Robert Salas's book, Faded Giant, 
However, he did contact me and agreed to have his story told, which I present in my new book, Wondrous, 25 True UFO Encounters. Mel wanted to do his part to aid disclosure and make sure that this very important event was not lost to history. In my humble opinion, I think what happened at Malmstrom Air Force Base was a clear message from the ETs not to mess around with nuclear power. This is certainly not a unique event. Many other missile sites with nuclear weapons have also been visited. Some have been shut down, and in other cases the missiles were actually activated. Many nuclear power stations as well have been visited by UFOs. Sites where nuclear weapons have been held, such as Rendlesham Forest, uh, have also been visited. Places where there's nuclear tests of any kind have also been visited. Anything involving nuclear power, nuclear-powered ships, nuclear-powered submarines, submarines that carry nuclear torpedoes, all have been visited. Anything to do with nuclear power at some point is being very closely observed by the extraterrestrials. And in addition, this is certainly one of the number one messages given to contactees who are taken on board a craft. Over and over again, contactees are given warnings about the dangers of nuclear weapons and nuclear warfare and the use of nuclear materials. The ETs are very, very concerned about this. That's why I am pretty sure that what happened at Malmstrom was not a hostile act. In fact, it was a friendly act. It was a friendly reminder to let us know that what we are doing is extremely dangerous and imperils the life of everyone on Earth. I think this is an extremely important event. It's one that deserves to be widely known, and that's why I wanted to do this video and make sure that this event uh, is not forgotten and that everyone knows that the ETs are very well aware of our use of nuclear weapons and nuclear power, and that they're very, very concerned about it. So yeah, that's why I wanted to do this video. I hope you've enjoyed it. I want to thank you very much for listening. I really appreciate it. Until next time, keep having fun.